please, if you are inside the World Trade Center towers, do not break windows. I'm right on the 82nd floor. Please, please, remain calm. Reports of an explosion of some sort at the World Trade Center. It is February 1993. The attack on New York's World Trade Center kills six people, wounds a thousand, but fails to destroy the Twin Towers. The masterminds of this attack are all living among us. They are determined to get it right the next time. December 1992. Here in Oklahoma City and around the country, the spirit of Christmas is brightened by a sense of relief. The U.S. is beginning to emerge from a recession. But on Christmas Day, here at the city's convention center, a very different kind of spirit prevails. This footage shows the annual gathering of the Muslim Arab Youth Association. A TV reporter decides to see what's happening. I had discovered there was a radical Islamic convention with groups representing every single organization that I had read about, but never suspected that they were present in the United States. In an auditorium filled with supporters, the speakers call for a holy war or jihad against Jews and Christians. They blame the West and Israel for oppressing Muslims around the world. The organizers are even selling children's coloring books, such as this one, extolling martyrdom. From a payphone inside the convention center, the reporter calls his contacts in the FBI counterterrorism department. He describes the scene. And they said, we don't know what you're talking about. And I said, I'm here, I'm witnessing it. These are the groups, there's Hamas, there's the Islamic Jihad, there's the Muslim Brotherhood, they're making speeches in Arabic, they're calling for Jihad. Are you not aware of this? And they said, we don't know what you've been smoking. The FBI takes no known action based on the reporter's tip. But in cities all across America, extremist groups are busy recruiting followers and honing a message of hatred. I think that picture of the network of radical Islamic groups operating thoroughly below the radar screen in the United States tells the story of 9-11. Atlanta, a Palestinian radical is on a fundraising tour detailing his dark vision of jihad. Blood must flow. There must be widows. There must be orphans. Detroit. This event is hosted by a group called the Islamic Charity Project International. One of its main speakers is a blind Egyptian cleric calling for Islam to rule the world. We conquer the land of infidels and we spread Islam by calling the infidels to Allah. In Chicago, Pittsburgh, Tucson, and elsewhere, the radical preachers insist that the jihad will succeed. Oh, brothers, after Afghanistan, nothing in the world is impossible for us anymore. This Arab preacher is carrying his message of hate into the American heartland. But on the other side of the globe, he and a partner are also busy creating a jihad network, a network that will eventually plan and execute the deadliest act of terrorism in history. 
Afghanistan, 1980. It is here that the road to 9-11 begins. Afghan rebels known as Mujahideen, or holy warriors, launch a guerrilla campaign against the occupying Soviet army. Muslims from other nations join the fight. They are determined to expel the Soviets from a Muslim land. Just across the border in Pakistan is the city of Peshawar. Pakistan supports the rebels, and Peshawar becomes a haven for those drawn to the holy war. The city is abuzz with arms dealers, drug dealers, clerics, wounded warriors, and CIA agents. I always thought it, uh, those years looked to me a lot like the bar scene in Star Wars. Because, I mean, it was just a very weird, surreal existence. Among the thousands of Muslims who would answer the call to jihad, this young man, six foot five inches tall, dressed in the baggy trousers and long linen shirt of an Afghan peasant. He is Osama bin Laden. He is 24 years old. Bin Laden is the son of a billionaire construction magnate in Saudi Arabia. But here the young man sleeps on a mattress on the floor. His charitable work earns him the nickname Samaritan in the refugee camps and hospitals. Murfreesboro, North Carolina, spring 1983. As the Afghan war rages, another young Muslim is finding his own way to the holy war. Starting from a tiny Baptist college, a group of Muslim students gather in this dormitory to pray. In the Islamic tradition, they leave their shoes outside the door. Other students would come and steal the shoes and throw them in the campus lake. Among the targets of the practical joke is this engineering major, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. He's the brainy and charming son of an imam, or Islamic priest. Khalid grew up in Kuwait, but his family comes from a remote region of Pakistan, and in Kuwait they are often treated like second-class citizens. His college years only deepen his resentment. When Khalid graduates, he heads to Pakistan. There, he joins one of his three brothers, who is running a charity for the Afghan rebels. 1984. Young Osama bin Laden uses some of his family fortune and contacts to bankroll a plan to create an international jihad network. It's the brainchild of radical cleric Abdullah Azam. Azam is a Palestinian whose hometown was occupied by Israel after the Arabs' crushing defeat in the Six-Day War. More than anyone, it is Azam who has inspired Muslims, including bin Laden, to head to Afghanistan. The men give their organization an unassuming name, the Office of Services. The headquarters in Pakistan supplies arms and training to volunteers headed to the front. 1986. By now, the Afghan war is turning in favor of the rebels. But Arab volunteers play only a small part. By far, the biggest factor is a shoulder-fired missile called the Stinger, courtesy of the CIA. The rebels start knocking Soviet helicopters out of the sky. Behind the scenes, bin Laden and Azam are opening branch offices of their jihad organization in 35 countries around the world. The U.S. will become a main focus. With a flagship outpost at this mosque, 
Al Farouk, here in Brooklyn, New York. They also set up shop in Boston, Chicago, Nashville, Atlanta, Sacramento, and 32 other cities. Many of the outposts are no more than a single individual raising money from an apartment or office. But the Jihad Network is laying a foundation for the future. It's creating an army of young men ready to fight the next battle in the Holy War. Jihad became a practical concept. It became approachable, accessible. It became something that empowered and mobilized the young masses within the Muslim world to start practicing a violent holy war. By the spring of 1987, Osama bin Laden has grabbed a rifle and joined the fighting. Soviet troops corner his band of Arab volunteers in the rugged hills of eastern Afghanistan in a place called Jaji. According to eyewitness accounts, one of bin Laden's comrades is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the young Muslim who studied engineering in North Carolina and who will become the engineer of 9-11. Soviet artillery and helicopter gunships bombard the men. As legend has it, after a month-long siege, the Arabs forced the Soviets to withdraw. The battle is widely reported in the Arab press. Overnight, the story turns bin Laden into a hero. Poets and singers celebrate the glory of the young Saudi warrior. This is sheer and utter nonsense. There is about a 15-second a piece of footage showing him with a, a radio and maybe a Kalashnikov hanging on his shoulder. And, and that's the great warrior. By the following summer of 1988, it's all but over for the once mighty Red Army. Soviet troops begin to withdraw. The Afghan rebels have won. I felt very gratified when we had the pictures of the Soviets crossing the various bridges out of Afghanistan and quite literally fleeing back to Russia. The victory electrifies the world of radical Islam, and the men who fought the battle of Jaji with bin Laden and Azam become the nucleus of a violent new force. It becomes known as the base. In Arabic, the name is Al-Qaeda. If not for the anti-Soviet multinational Afghan Jihad, Mujahideen from around the world would not have come to defeat one superpower and after that to turn their guns against another superpower, the United States. November 1989, Bin Laden's partner, Abdullah Azam, is driving to a mosque in Peshawar, Pakistan with two of his sons. A car bomb explodes, killing them instantly. The murder, never solved, has the hallmarks of a mob rub out. With Azam out of the way, bin Laden quickly reorganizes the jihad network around himself. Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, August 1990. Bin Laden has returned home from the Afghan war. He hopes to use his family's vast wealth and political connections to grow his Al-Qaeda network of holy warriors. But the 33-year-old Bin Laden is in for one of the biggest disappointments of his life. August 2nd, 1990. Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait and threatens the neighboring kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Bin Laden approaches the Saudi government with an offer. He will summon his Arab fighters who battled the Soviets. They will protect the kingdom from the Iraqi invaders. 
Only holy warriors, says bin Laden, should defend Islam's holiest sites. Instead, the Saudi royal family chooses the protection offered by U.S. President George Bush. Bin Laden was politely turned down and uh, told that Kuwait is not Afghanistan. Thank you, don't call us, we'll call you. The Saudis let U.S. troops use their kingdom as a staging area from which to drive Saddam from Kuwait. It's a devastating blow to bin Laden. It was that personal humiliation that led him to become the number one terrorist in the world. For bin Laden, the U.S. troops massing in the desert are living proof that the United States is the great infidel and that all U.S. allies in the Middle East are enemies of Allah. He begins to spread the word to his followers that the Saudi royal family must be overthrown. At the same time, bin Laden's far-flung jihad network is roaring to life. New York, November 5th, 1990. This 34-year-old Egyptian named El Said Nasser dons the yarmulke of an observant Jew and pockets a 357 Magnum revolver. Nasser belongs to the Al Farouk Mosque in Brooklyn, a top jihad outpost in the U.S. Nasser enters a ballroom at this Midtown Manhattan hotel. Rabbi Meir Kahani, head of the tiny but violent Jewish Defense League, is finishing a speech to his followers. As Kahani steps down from the podium, Nasser pulls out the gun, fires twice, and a fatal shot enters the rabbi's throat. Nasser flees the hotel, but an armed postal officer shoots him, and police arrest him. For the public, and largely for law enforcement, the killing of Kahana was portrayed as one crazy Arab killing one crazy Jew. That wasn't the case. We all now realize that was really the first first major incident on U.S. soil that the radical Islamists conducted, the ones that we currently know today as Al-Qaeda. Al FBI and police searched Nosaire's home here in Cliffside Park, New Jersey. They find more than a thousand rounds of ammunition, bomb-making formulas, U.S. military training manuals, and a hit list of other prominent Jews. They haul 47 boxes of this material to this police precinct. It's a treasure trove of intelligence. But the authorities, the DA, the NYPD, the FBI, overlook most of it. While the FBI investigates some suspicious individuals at the Al Farouk Mosque, they do not investigate the mosque itself. So they fail to establish that the mosque is being used as a front by a terror cell with connections to bin Laden and his growing jihad network. The FBI at that time was working under a very tight set of guidelines, which made it ex extremely difficult to collect information inside any kind of religious organization, in, and certainly any church or mosque. All it took was that people in the FBI and the CIA to do their job and talk to each other and connect the dots and share the intelligence. If that had happened on the road to 9-11, it wouldn't have happened. The next step on the road to 9-11 will be a casual conversation between two boyhood friends who want nothing more than to come to America and blow up buildings. Khartoum, Sudan, April 1991.
Osama bin Laden moves with his four wives, numerous children, and a core group of supporters here to this poor capital city in East Africa. Bin Laden is now living in exile from his native Saudi Arabia. He cuts a deal with the radical Islamic government of Sudan. Al-Qaeda provides money and weapons in return for sanctuary. From his new headquarters, bin Laden keeps an eye on activities in the land of his new mortal enemy, the United States. Brooklyn, New York, November 1991. Members of the Al Farouk Mosque are raising funds for the defense of El Sayed Nasser. Nasser is about to go on trial for the murder of Rabbi Meir Kahani. Osama bin Laden personally contributes $20,000 to the Legal Defense Fund. Outspoken civil rights attorney William Kunstler is hired to defend Nasser. Eyewitnesses testify. They saw Nocer crouched by Kahani holding a gun. But Kunstler convinces the jury that no scientific evidence links Nocer to the shooting. The Egyptian is found guilty only of a minor weapons charge. Nocer had been pretty much a nobody, and overnight, the murder of Kahani vaulted him from nobody status to somebody who was in the Jihad Hall of Fame. Pakistan, summer 1992. A young Pakistani named Ramzi Youssef has just finished a course in bomb making at an Al-Qaeda training camp. The 24-year-old, nicknamed the chemist, likes to wear Armani suits. He holds an electrical engineering degree from a technical college in Wales. He's talking on the phone with a boyhood friend, Abdul Murad. He tells Murad his goal in life, to go to America, blow up buildings and kill Jews, as many as he can. Murad gives him an idea. Murad says, well, you know, a lot of Jews in New York. Uh, <laughs> and later tells him, you know, there are a lot of Jews who work at the World Trade Center. From this conversation, an idea takes shape and a plan is put in motion. New York, September 1st, 1992. A Pakistani Airlines flight from Karachi lands here at Kennedy Airport. Seated in the first-class cabin, Ramzi Youssef. He's traveling with a Palestinian terrorist named Ahmad Ajaj. The two men exit the plane and approach parallel stalls at an immigration post. The six-foot-tall Youssef, dressed in a three-piece silk Afghan suit, presents a perfectly forged Iraqi passport. He demands political asylum. When immigration officials question Ajaj, they discover that he's carrying several crudely fake passports and a suitcase stuffed with bomb-making manuals. If he'd been wearing a t-shirt that said terrorist, he couldn't have been more clear that he was up to no good. Immigration agents take Ajaj into custody. They assign him a bed at this INS detention facility. But Youssef is allowed into the US and told to appear at an immigration hearing. The men's performance has worked like a charm. Ajaj creates such a stir and commotion and smokescreen that Ramzi Youssef, the Mozart of Tara, is able to slip into America. Youssef trolls the airport cab stand until he finds a Pakistani driver. He hands the cabbie a slip of paper with an address. 552 Atlantic Avenue, Brooklyn. Brother, I have just arrived from Karachi, he says. 
I have friends who will pay. The driver takes him here to the Al Farouk Mosque. Yusuf receives the blessings of a blind Egyptian cleric who is now in charge of the mosque, Sheikh Omar Abdul Rahman. The blind Sheikh, as he is known, is an ally of Osama bin Laden. He has approved Yusuf's plan to place a truck bomb in the basement of the World Trade Center. Throughout the fall and winter, Yusuf and three other members of the Al Farouk Mosque are hard at work inside this storage facility in Jersey City, New Jersey, just across the Hudson River from Manhattan. Under Youssef's direction, they assemble the device they hope will topple the Twin Towers and kill thousands of people. February 26, 1993. Two strands of Islamic terrorism converge for an attack on this symbol of America's global dominance. The Blind Sheikh provides the manpower and inspiration. Ramzi Youssef, the bomb-making expertise. Hovering in the background is the growing Al-Qaeda network, led by Osama bin Laden. Youssef packs a rented rider truck with a volatile mixture of 1,500 pounds of fertilizer, fuel oil, and nitroglycerin. Around noon, he and three colleagues park the truck in a garage two stories beneath the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Minutes later, Yusef lights the fuse with a cheap cigarette lighter and speeds off. Twelve seventeen p.m. The bomb rips a seven-story hole right through the tower's core. Six people are killed. It became clear that this was a declaration of war, and it was a, a campaign that was being waged and a campaign that was being planned. Across the river, Youssef watches a column of smoke rise over Lower Manhattan. He knows he has failed. The bomb was not powerful enough. He was disappointed that he hadn't sent Tower 1 crashing into Tower 2. And from that moment on, Ramzi Youssef vowed that he or his operatives would return to New York and finish the job he'd started in 1993. That night, Youssef makes his way to New York's JFK airport. Before the bombing, he had drafted a letter claiming credit for the attack on behalf of what he calls the 5th Battalion of the Liberation Army. According to an FBI source, Youssef calls one of his fellow terrorists from the airport. He dictates a new ending to the letter. It states, our calculations were not very accurate this time. However, we promise you that next time it will be very precise. And the Trade Center will be one of our targets. With that, Yusef boards his flight and flies first class to Karachi, Pakistan. It's hard for me to express to people how dangerous these guys really are and the dedication and fervor of their beliefs, their extreme desire to want to destroy Western civilization. Ramzi Youssef is so determined to strike another, more devastating blow against the West that he will now play a key role in hatching the plot that becomes 9-11. Pakistan, July 1994. The U.S. State Department distributes 37,000 matchbooks throughout Pakistan. They have this picture of terrorist Ramzi Youssef on the cover. They promise a $2 million reward for information leading to his capture. Over the past year, since the truck bombing of the World Trade Center, the FBI has discovered bank records and fingerprints showing 
that Yusef was the mastermind. The young engineer with a weakness for Armani suits is indeed living in his native Pakistan. But Yusef's well protected by the country's radical Islamic community. And he is still stung by his failure to topple the Twin Towers. Ramsey has no shortage of plans. I mean, this guy is like, he's going to assassinate Benazir Bhutto. He's going to blow up the American consulate in Karachi. He's going to attack a nuclear plant. You name it, he was, he was ready to go. August 1994, in a deserted warehouse here in the bustling city of Lahore, Pakistan, Youssef is teaching his childhood friend, Abdul Murad, how to build bombs. Youssef calls it making chocolate. Murad has returned to Pakistan after two years training at flight schools in Texas, North Carolina, and New York. It was Murad who gave Youssef the idea to bomb the World Trade Center. Now the two men are brainstorming again, coming up with ingenious ways to kill lots of civilians. At one point, Murad thought, you could take a plane, you could turn a plane into a bomb. You could fly it into a building, you could kill a lot of people with it. Karachi, Pakistan. The two young men meet at a restaurant on Tariq Road. They discuss the airplane idea with someone who could help make it happen. That someone is Ramzi Youssef's well-connected uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who studied engineering in North Carolina and then fought alongside Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan. They propose a suicide mission to fly a commercial jet loaded with fuel into CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. Youssef's uncle is intrigued and wants to know more. Since the Afghan war, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed has been traveling through China, Malaysia, Qatar, Bosnia, and Brazil, raising money to support the jihad cause. He presses his nephew's old friend Murad for details about the length of pilot training, the screening process, even the addresses of U.S. flight schools. The obvious person to fund such a scheme would be Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's fellow Afghan war veteran, Osama bin Laden. Hamburg, Germany, 1994. By now, bin Laden has sway over Arab radicals not only in the Middle East and America, but in Europe as well. Hamburg is home to Islamic radicals who share bin Laden's worldview. In a drab housing complex on this college campus, one of the men who will execute the bloodiest terror attack in history is undergoing a dark transformation. A 27-year-old Egyptian graduate student named Mohammed Atta pads around his tiny apartment in blue flip-flops. Atta comes from a secular middle-class family in Cairo, Egypt. He's in Germany to get a master's degree in urban planning. Atta's hard work, discipline, and technical skills have earned him high marks from his professors. You know, to impress a German, you have to be a perfectionist. He was a perfectionist in, in, in every sense. But like many other young Arab men, Atta is angry and alienated. He hates the Egyptian regime back home. It's repressive. It's allied with the US. And it's at peace with Israel. While in Hamburg, Atta begins to embrace radical Islam. He wears the same few pieces of clothing every day. Cotton pants and a sweater his mother knit for him. His roommate sometimes sees Atta sitting alone, eating mashed potatoes right out of a pot. When he was full, he shoved the whole pot in the refrigerator with the fork stuck in it. Take it out the next day, eat some more. 
Otto prays five times a day, no matter where he is. At the local mosque, he hears talk of jihad and martyrdom. He does not yet know anything about the plot that will become 9-11, but his mind and spirit are preparing for it nonetheless. Khartoum, Sudan, 1994. For the past three years, Osama bin Laden has been running Al-Qaeda from his headquarters here in East Africa. Al-Qaeda is now an international terrorist organization with operatives in Egypt, Yemen, Somalia, Bosnia, and Chechnya. At this point, Al-Qaeda begins to appear on the CIA's radar screen. The agency gives the White House a briefing that mentions bin Laden. It calls his headquarters in Sudan, quote, the Ford Foundation of Sunni Islamic Terrorism, giving grants for violent attacks around the world. We had a, a lot of circumstantial evidence. We weren't quite sure what it meant. Was bin Laden really a threat, or was he just another Saudi spendthrift who was throwing money around to radicals? He seemed to be coming up everywhere. He was like Elvis. Every time you read about a terrorist group in a different country carrying out violent action, you heard the name Osama bin Laden, and you wondered whether it was just sort of a fictional person. Agents based in Sudan are authorized to keep an eye on bin Laden, but nothing more. You have to understand that our charter was to collect intelligence. We did not have a charter to conduct action. There was no um, arrest warrant on Osama bin Laden. All the while, Al-Qaeda is expanding its reach and influence. While bin Laden consolidates power and contacts from behind the walls of his gated compound, Al-Qaeda members compile a 10-volume, 7,000-page how-to manual for terrorists. Al-Qaeda training camps are terrorist assembly lines churning out Muslim warriors who then return home, ready to die for the jihad. For every person you trained, he was supposed to go back and train one or two persons. And then those people would train someone else, and it kind of grew uh, exponentially. And these guys are run like an intelligence organization, and we know some of the people who trained them. They have great patience. By the end of 1994, three such patient men, deeply committed to the Jihad movement, Ramzi Youssef, his friend Abdul Murad, and his uncle Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, are nurturing the most ambitious terrorist plot in history. Manila, the Philippines, January 6th, 1995. Mastermind of the World Trade Center truck bombing, Ramzi Youssef has relocated here from his native Pakistan. In this six-story building on President Carino Boulevard, Youssef has set up a terror workshop with his old friend, Abdul Murad. He has transformed the kitchen into a bomb factory. As Youssef cooks up explosives by the sink, the concoction accidentally ignites. The acrid smoke drives the two men from their apartment. It attracts the attention of the Philippine National Police. Youssef escapes to a nearby karaoke bar, but he sends Murad back to his apartment to retrieve his Toshiba laptop which he uses to store his plans for terror attacks. Police arrest Murad as he tries to flee. They also seize the laptop. Youssef is watching from across the street. Within hours, he buys a first-class ticket to Singapore, 
and slips out of the country. Days later, at this Philippine military base, members of the Philippine National Police are interrogating Abdul Murad. He refuses to say much. Police beat him until his ribs break. They extinguish cigarettes in his ears and on his genitals. They force so much water down his throat, he nearly drowns. After a month, he finally cracks. He reveals details of terrorist schemes that he developed with Ramzi Youssef. One was a plot to kill Pope John Paul II. Another was to use an ingenious detonator designed by Youssef to blow up 12 American jetliners over the Pacific Ocean. Murad confesses that he personally was planning to dive bomb a plane into CIA headquarters in Langley, Virginia. According to this man, Philippine Colonel Rodolfo Mendoza, Murad describes another far more daring operation. Teams of hijackers would use commercial jetliners as missiles against landmark buildings within the United States. We had up to 10 Islamic terrorists training in U.S. flight schools. That plot was well in motion, and Ramzi Youssef had it all on his Toshiba laptop. They had up to seven targets, including the Trade Center, the Pentagon, a nuclear facility, CIA headquarters, the Sears and Transamerica Towers, and the White House. Colonel Mendoza insists that he shared all this information with the FBI. The FBI acknowledges receiving intelligence from Mendoza, but claims there were no details about the plot that became 9-11. By now, the FBI's $2 million reward for information on Youssef finally yields a tip. Islamabad, Pakistan, February 7th, 1995. U.S. authorities confirm that Youssef is hiding out in a safe house. The building is owned by Osama bin Laden. A team of American and Pakistani agents race through Islamabad toward the Sukasa guest house. They literally jumped out of the cars, ran up the steps, kicked in the door of his hotel, and he was laying in bed. They arrest Youssef and take him into custody. His uncle, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is in another room of the same Al-Qaeda safe house. But the uncle walks away into the shadows of radical Islam's underground network. And it now becomes Khalid Sheikh Mohammed's mission to carry out the idea developed with his nephew for flying commercial planes into American landmarks. Within 36 hours of Youssef's arrest, FBI agents are transporting him by helicopter to a New York City jail to await trial. The pilot passes the Twin Towers. One of the FBI agents lifts Youssef's hood and points toward the World Trade Center. See, it's still standing, he says. Ramsey Youssef replies that if he'd had enough time and money, he would have brought the whole thing down. Saudi Arabia, May 1995. Egyptian graduate student Mohammed Atta performs a Hajj, the ritual pilgrimage to the holiest sites in Islam. The experience has a profound effect on him. He returns to Hamburg, Germany. But Atta loses interest in his academic work. Radical Islam now dictates his daily routine. As graduation nears, a work-study grant allows him to return to his native Cairo. But when Atta looks for a job, the urban planning major can't find one. All he finds is corruption and nepotism. 
a world he cannot crack. I should imagine Atta every single time that he went back to Cairo uh, during his stay in, um, uh, in Germany, uh, that he got even more and more frustrated. And I think gradually he was there for the taking. By 1996, Mohammed Atta is already a familiar face at this storefront mosque in Hamburg called Al Quds. It's a hotbed of radical Islam. Among those coming to the nightly prayers is at least one Al Qaeda recruiter. Atta takes his place among the rows of angry, alienated young men. They hear fiery imams call out for the blood of Jews, Christians, even Muslims who have strayed from the true path. They are told that Allah will reward their martyrdom with glories in heaven that include sex with 72 virgins. Asmara, Eritrea, summer 1996. A young man walks into the U.S. Embassy in this tiny East African nation just across from Saudi Arabia. The informant tells U.S. officials that he has recently been caught embezzling more than $110,000 from Osama bin Laden's headquarters in Sudan. He fears for his life. The young Sudanese man agrees to tell U.S. authorities everything he knows about bin Laden and the Jihad network. They designate him confidential source number one and bring him to the U.S. for questioning. The defector tells U.S. prosecutors the names of key members of al-Qaeda's hierarchy. He also describes bin Laden's recruitment methods. Some of the things he told us, for example, about you know, people signing contracts to join al-Qaeda, I thought at first that was laughable and thought, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, people are going to sign paperwork and have personnel files. But I think that's when the light bulb went off and we started thinking of him differently than a financier, and he became an operational terrorist leader. It is now clear to American officials that bin Laden is much more than a rich Saudi playboy, frittering away his wealth on the jihad cause. He is, instead, the mastermind of a global terrorist conspiracy to kill Americans. Jalalabad, Afghanistan, summer 1996. Bin Laden has returned to the country that launched his career as a holy warrior. He's back here because the U.S. and the U.N. have pressured the government of Sudan to end its cozy arrangement with the al-Qaeda leader. They kick him out. So he arrives in Afghanistan in the early summer of 1996, and what does he do? The first thing he does is retreat to a camp outside of Jalalabad, and he writes a very long declaration of war against the United States. Bin Laden calls for a new holy war to evict U.S. troops from Saudi Arabia. He intends to launch this jihad from his base in Afghanistan. It sent shockwaves through us. It was pretty clear from the first that bin Laden meant what he said, but it didn't catch much attention. September 1996. A radical Islamic sect called the Taliban seizes control of the Afghan government and its capital city, Kabul. In exchange for millions of dollars in al-Qaeda funding, the Taliban agreed to provide a haven for bin Laden and his organization. The CIA's newly created bin Laden unit learns that al-Qaeda has a military committee planning operations against U.S. interests worldwide, and that bin Laden has tried to acquire nuclear and chemical weapons. At his new headquarters, bin Laden starts taking meetings with terrorists looking to get their pet projects funded. They waited for freelancers to come by and say, listen, I have a project. Um, I'm going to attack this, or I'm going to blow up that, or I'm going to assassinate this person. And if they really liked the project a lot, then they would uh, fund it quite a bit. Um, and it sort of operated like a franchise. 
One of these freelancers is Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. Sometime in the middle of 1996, he reunites with fellow Afghan war veteran Osama bin Laden at bin Laden's camp in Tora Bora, Afghanistan. Since the arrest a year earlier of his nephew, Ramzi Youssef, he has been identified by the FBI as a terrorist. In fact, U.S. intelligence will begin referring to him by his initials, KSM. He fled to Afghanistan just as FBI agents were closing in. KSM pitches bin Laden several ideas he developed with his nephew. Among them is a highly ambitious plot to fly commercial jets into American landmark buildings, including the World Trade Center. Bin Laden listens to the idea. He knows that if it were to succeed and the U.S. retaliated against Al-Qaeda, it would be exactly what he wants, a battle with the great Satan on his own turf. Together, KSM and bin Laden will begin to develop the details for what they call the planes operation. They will train teams of men to hijack U.S. commercial airliners and use them as missiles to attack symbols of American power. And before long, bin Laden will start proclaiming his jihad directly to the American people. We do not differentiate between those dressed in military uniforms and civilians. He said, I predict a black day for the United States, a day uh, after which the United States will not be the same as we know it. In the years to come, the Al-Qaeda leader will provide a number of signs that such a black day is indeed coming. Just how black a day is something Americans are unable to imagine. Nineteen ninety seven. The American economy is on a tear. Unemployment is at a twenty eight year low. Internet stocks are levitating. The chairman of the Federal Reserve sums up the era with a single phrase irrational exuberance. Afghanistan. The CIA begins to gather intelligence about the day-to-day -day movements of Al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden. The analysts are working up an ambush plan. They want to capture but not kill bin Laden. The goal is to bring him to trial for a series of crimes. It's a list that includes the training of militiamen who shot down two American helicopters and killed 18 army rangers in Somalia. The 1993 attack became known as Black Hawk Down. But bin Laden has begun to take evasive action. He moves frequently around Afghanistan, inspecting his many terror training camps. Then he returns to a place called Tarnak Farms near Kandahar, where he lives with three of his four wives and several of his children. In some ways, his routine is like that of a businessman with a daily commute. He grab his lunchbox in the morning, go to Kandahar and see his, uh, how his businesses were doing and talk to the Taliban leaders and then come home at night. In the spring of 1998, the CIA plan to snatch bin Laden moves forward with the tacit approval of the White House. May 20th, the CIA runs a full rehearsal with its local allies, Afghan militiamen opposed to bin Laden and the Taliban. The plan is for the militiamen to capture bin Laden and take him to a desert landing zone. From there, the Al-Qaeda leader would be flown out of the country. That very same week, inside a tent in a remote compound in southern Afghanistan, Osama bin Laden tapes an interview with ABC News correspondent John Miller. With the tape rolling, 
he declares war on the United States. We do not differentiate between those dressed in military uniforms and civilians. They're all targets in this fatwa. Before agreeing to the interview, bin Laden insisted on knowing what questions he'll be asked and whether the program would be broadcast in prime time. It was his coming out party as a terrorist leader. He needed to introduce himself to the United States um, through a American news medium. Bin Laden's message is crystal clear. He demands that U.S. troops leave Saudi Arabia, where they have been stationed since the 1991 Gulf War. If not, he threatens more attacks, like the 1993 truck bombing of the World Trade Center, masterminded by Pakistani Ramzi Youssef. We anticipate a black future for America. If the present injustice continues, it will inevitably move the battle to American soil, just as Ramzi Youssef and others have done. Uh, bin Laden said many things uh, that at the time, I have to say, sounded a little hyperbolic and unlikely. Uh, he declared war on the United States. Yeah, you and what army? At the CIA office in Islamabad, Pakistan, agents are awaiting word from Washington to go ahead with the plan to seize bin Laden. Then, at the last minute, a satellite photo of bin Laden's compound reveals a problem. There's a story that there was a swing set there. And they said, well, look, there's children there, and we're, you know, we're going to, children will die probably if there's a gunfight, and there inevitably will be one, because there's no way they're going to get in, get bin Laden, and get him out in, in silence. American authorities are not prepared to risk that civilians, including children, might be killed. The U.S. scrubs the mission. Hamburg, Germany. Spring 1998. Mohammed Atta has just returned to graduate school after taking a three-month unscheduled break. There are few records of his travel during this long hiatus. He applies for a new passport, even though his old one has not yet expired. He may be trying to cleanse his travel record of a trip to Al-Qaeda training camps in Afghanistan. Here in Wilhelmsburg, south of Hamburg, Ada rents a two-room third-floor walk-up. He pays the $250 a month rent, but many other Arab men also come and go. The blinds are always shut. Their downstairs neighbors never hear a radio or television, only stocking footsteps and muffled voices of the men above. Two of these men will work under Atta's command to carry out the 9-11 attacks. One is Ramzi bin al-Shib, a 26-year-old whom Atta met at Al-Quds, one of the most radical mosques in Germany. I mean, people were frightened uh, of what they heard. Parents warned their children not to go there. It has this sort of, this, this very harsh, weighty message, uh, but it also has this, this this embrace, um, and it, the combination of the two is powerful. At the mosque, Atta's cold and often rude behavior is balanced by bin al-Shib's good humor and playfulness. He is seen as the peacemaker at Al-Quds, where the two friends lecture to young men on the Quran. Another young member of the mosque is this man, 20-year-old Marwan al-Shehi. Shehi grew up in a rural part of the United Arab Emirates, where his father was a prayer leader at the neighborhood mosque. He is a born storyteller. Shehi's engaging personality, as well as his knowledge of Islam and the Quran, draw the others toward him. The three men gather to pray. It is Shehi who leads Atta and bin al-Shiv to embrace the radical Islamic interpretation of jihad, a process that ultimately convinces them to become martyrs in a suicide mission. Shehi knows that jihad is the answer. 
Chehi seemed to arrive at a time and with a force of personality that was, I, I, I think, crucial. He might have been the thing that was needed to, to take away the, the fear and the mystery of it, I think. A fourth man joins the group later that year. At the Al-Quds Mosque, Bin al-Shib befriends this man, Ziad Jarrah, a 23-year-old Lebanese engineering student. Jarrah is enrolled in an aircraft technology course here at the University of Applied Sciences. It's 10 miles from where Mohammed Atta is studying urban planning. In the 1980s, Jarrah attended private Christian schools back home in Beirut, Lebanon, and enjoyed the trappings of a westernized middle-class existence. Handsome and fun-loving, he squired girlfriends around in his father's Mercedes. In Germany, Jarrah maintains a relationship with an attractive dental student named Isil Sengwin, the daughter of Turkish immigrants. They are close, despite their different personalities. She is outgoing and independent, while he becomes increasingly private and quiet. Isil and Jarrah frequently quarrel, separate, and then reconcile. Isil is hectoring him. She doesn't know where he is. She can't go. She tried to call him last night. He wasn't home. And with her, she knew it wasn't another woman, that it was, it was the mosque. It was the boys from the mosque. Nairobi, Kenya, August 7, 1998. Osama bin Laden makes good on his threats. It's been less than two months since his televised declaration of war on the U.S. A bomb-laden truck explodes outside the American embassy, tearing the facade off the building. Five minutes later, a second blast nearly levels the U.S. embassy in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. The twin attacks kill more than 200 people including 12 Americans. Many of the victims are Muslims. Two weeks later, President Clinton orders retaliation. Today, I ordered our armed forces to strike at terrorist-related facilities in Afghanistan and Sudan. The US unleashes scores of Tomahawk cruise missiles against targets in Sudan and Afghanistan including a pharmaceutical plant in Khartoum, Sudan, that was allegedly producing chemicals used to make nerve gas. Some Americans, however, view the military strikes as a way for the president to divert attention from another crisis, a sex scandal involving Clinton and a White House intern named Monica Lewinsky. The Afghanistan-Pakistan border, fall 1998. In the streets, the African embassy bombings raise bin Laden's stature. I went back to Afghanistan and Pakistan again in, that, in 1998, and the people were starting to look like him, and then you know, bin Laden t-shirts are starting to be out there. And then one of my... Uh, Pashtun friend says, you got to understand how many kids born this year were named Osama. Bin Laden now turns his attention to other operations, including a suicide assault on an American warship and an even more ambitious project, what he calls the Plains Operation. It's a plan to use commercial airliners to strike civilian targets in America. Perhaps he has learned from the mistakes of other terrorists. Five years earlier, in December 1994, an Algerian group hijacked an Air France flight bound for Paris. The plan was to crash the plane into the Eiffel Tower. The problem was that none of the hijackers knew how to fly a plane. The pilots tricked the terrorists into landing the aircraft. French police killed all four hijackers. Washington, D.C., December 4th, 1998. 
Bill Clinton's presidential daily brief includes a warning. Al-Qaeda is planning to hijack a jetliner. The purpose? To force the release of the blind sheikh, Omar Abdel Rahman, and Ramzi Youssef. Both men are serving life terms in U.S. prisons. The blind sheikh for a plot to blow up New York bridges and tunnels. Ramzi Youssef for the 1993 World Trade Center bombing. To address the warning, White House counterterrorism officials place New York airports under maximum security. There are no attacks. On January 31st, 1999, the alert is lifted. Clinton now authorizes lethal force in the pursuit of bin Laden. In Hamburg, bin Laden's declaration of war on the U.S. has a profound effect on Mohammed Atta and his group of radical friends. That winter, three of them move into this apartment at Marienstrasse 54. They call it Dar al Ansar, or the House of Followers. Within a year, all four men travel to bin Laden's headquarters in Kandahar, Afghanistan. There, they come face to face with the man who will turn their passion for jihad into a bloody reality. Kandahar, Afghanistan, February 1999. Osama bin Laden is on vacation, enjoying a few weeks of falcon hunting in the desert. The CIA now has President Clinton's approval to take bin Laden dead or alive. Afghan fighters working with the U.S. set up tracking devices that can pinpoint targets for destruction. The U.S. Navy prepares for a Tomahawk cruise missile strike. All that's needed is bin Laden's exact location. Questions from Washington. What tent is bin Laden in? When is he in the tent? Where does he go to the bathroom? Is there a tent that's a mosque there, so that, you know, used as a mosque, so we don't want to hit that? A satellite photo then reveals that bin Laden is hunting with a crown prince from the United Arab Emirates, an oil-rich nation that has good relations with the U.S. Once again, the operation has become complicated. CIA and military commanders now estimate as many as two to 300 civilian casualties. Against William Jefferson Clinton. Adding to the confusion, the President Clinton has been impeached on charges of perjury and obstruction of justice. The US Senate is set to vote within days on whether to remove him from office. Despite all that, Clinton and his advisors must focus on another dilemma. Should they risk killing civilians and damaging relations with a friendly Arab nation in order to kill a terrorist few Americans have heard of? Once again, U.S. authorities decide to cancel military action against bin Laden. I wrote back saying, you know, we really missed an opportunity here. Um, and uh, it would be unfortunate if s some senior princes of the UAE were, were killed, but they knew who bin Laden was. It wasn't like the, bin Laden was some you know, mystery guest. They decided uh, not to shoot because it might have killed the Arab prince. Well, the world is lousy with Arab princes. And, you know, Sister Mary used to say, you're known by the company you keep. Bin Laden leaves the compound two days later. And he hereby is acquitted of the charges in the said articles. That same day, February 12th, 1999, the Senate acquits President Clinton. Bin Laden now moves ahead with the planes operation. It's part of his strategy to provoke a U.S. invasion of Afghanistan. An American attack, he predicts, would unite the forces of jihad against the great Satan. A replay of the war with the Soviets. From his cave headquarters in Tora Bora, bin Laden had revealed his grand scheme to the editor of a London-based Arabic newspaper. 
he told me that. He said, it is extremely difficult to go and fight the Americans on their own turf. Uh, if I succeed to bring them in and fight them in my home ground, uh, I will succeed. Uh, I will defeat them. To execute the planes operation, bin Laden needs trustworthy men who accept radical Islam's glorification of death, men willing to martyr themselves for the glory of Allah. Al-Qaeda's attack was to inspire and instigate, to show the way as a trendsetter, as a pioneer. The Western reaction would uh, certainly arouse the Arab world to anger and, and probably probably uh, result in the revival of the fortunes of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan or elsewhere. Bin Laden is poised to add a chilling new chapter to the history of terrorism. It will be a war with no uniforms, no front lines, and no mercy. Spring 1999, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed or KSM, as he is known to U.S. intelligence, meets with Osama bin Laden at an al-Qaeda camp near Kandahar, Afghanistan. The two men have never been close, but bin Laden's growing commitment to the planes operation convinces KSM to abandon his freelance status and formally join al-Qaeda. They discuss potential targets, including the White House, the Capitol Building, the Pentagon, and the World Trade Center. That fall, four young disciples of radical Islam make their way from Hamburg, Germany, to an Al-Qaeda terror training camp in southeastern Afghanistan. The men fill out application forms. They provide details about their education, work skills, and language abilities. People who could travel without much question were valued. People who could speak English who lived in the West were valued. Uh, so sort of the, it isn't even them themselves so much as the things that they brought with them. The last question, would you be willing to participate in a jihad operation? Then they are invited to bin Laden's personal residence at the compound. It's a rare honor for Al Qaeda recruits. Bin Laden asks the men if they are willing to carry out a jihad mission in the United States. Bin al-Sheib and Shehi had long since embraced the idea of martyrdom. But Atta has been considering returning to Egypt to care for his ailing mother. And Jarrah has just married his Turkish girlfriend. Nevertheless, all four accept taking an oath of fealty to bin Laden. They all knew before they left Kandahar that they were going to die for Allah. How? They don't know. Where? They don't know. They just didn't know the details exactly. So that if somebody, if one or more of them were apprehended, they wouldn't be able to give up the full details of the operation. Bin Laden designates Mohammed Atta, the oldest and most educated of the group, as the leader. Atta is obedient and obsessive in his attention to detail. Mohammed Atta and Ramzi bin al Sheib cross the border from Afghanistan and make their way to Karachi, Pakistan. There, they meet with KSM for further training. KSM will be the mission's paymaster and day to day supervisor. After years of discussion, the idea of flying hijacked jetliners into buildings in America now has a budget, a leader, and a plan. Hamburg, Germany, spring 2000. Four young men chosen by bin Laden for a suicide mission in America have reported their passports stolen. They receive new ones with no record of their trips to Afghanistan. With the clean documents, three of them, Mohammed Atta, Marwan al Shehi, and Ziad Jarrah, apply for and receive U.S. visas. But the U.S. denies a visa to the fourth man, Ramzi bin al Sheib, because he's viewed as someone who may try to immigrate to America. Osama bin Laden searches his Afghan training camps for a replacement. 
he picks this man, Hani Hanjour, a 29-year-old Saudi who is already licensed in the U.S. as a commercial pilot. Hanjour will now return to the U.S. and train on jumbo jet simulators. Newark, New Jersey, May 29, 2000. Marwan al-Shehi, the Hamburg cell member who knows the most about the Quran, passes through U.S. immigration here at Newark Airport. Five days later, ringleader Mohammed Atta also arrives through Newark. Ziad Jarrah, the easygoing Beirut native with a Turkish wife, arrives on June 27th. He flies to Venice, Florida, where he begins taking lessons here at the Florida Flight Training Center. He showed initiative and paid attention to detail. He was sharp. And I thought he had good potential to become a good airline pilot. Giras settles in, sharing space with a fellow student here across the street from the flight school. Within a few weeks, Atta and Shehi also wind up in Venice. They sign up for classes here at Huffman Aviation. They rent this pink bungalow in Nokomis, just minutes away from their flight school. Their landlord was most impressed because even in the summertime, they didn't turn the air conditioner on. You know, I don't know if it's because they liked the heat from the desert or if they were just saving money. By mid-August, Jura, Atta, and Shehi all pass their flight tests. The FAA grants them licenses as private pilots. But they lack the skills to navigate a large jetliner, so they enroll in advanced training on simulators which replicate the controls of a commercial aircraft. The men have never actually flown a jumbo jet, but by the end of 2000, they have enough skills to guide one into a target. 70 miles away, at this Air Force base in Tampa, members of the U.S. Military Special Operations Command are reviewing an unusual chart. It reportedly identifies both Atta and Shehi as likely members of an Al-Qaeda terror cell operating within the U.S. The officials decide they cannot pass this information along to the FBI, in part because the men are holding valid U.S. visas and may be off limits from intelligence gathering by the military. Kandahar, Afghanistan. Bin Laden is busy searching his training camps for more volunteers. He's decided to strike at least four prominent targets in the U.S. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is managing the plot for Bin Laden, decides that he needs teams of at least five hijackers to take over each airplane. Besides a pilot, the team includes so-called muscle hijackers to overpower the crew and passengers. Most of them were drawn from, uh, according to Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, he told me what is called uh, um, uh, Department of Martyrs in Kandahar at the time. Uh, many people who um, came from Yemen, from the Sudan, from Saudi, who wanted to die for Allah. They, they are very simple thinking um, kind of people. These men receive special training for their sole responsibility, storming the cockpit, seizing control of the aircraft. They practice bodybuilding and hand-to-hand -hand combat. They learn basic English words and common phrases. They trim their hair and beards. And they are taught to blend into and steel themselves against the corrupting influence of the West. To prepare themselves to kill people on the airplanes, the men practice slitting the throats of camels. Some make these martyrdom videos. After their deaths, these messages will be combined with footage of the devastation they have created and find their way into Al-Qaeda recruitment tapes. We'll send a bloody message to Americans by attacking them in the heartland. I am writing this with my full conscience, and I am writing this with expectation of the end. Aden, Yemen, October 12, 2000. 
The USS Cole, a guided missile destroyer, is anchored in the harbor. 11.15 a.m., a small fiberglass supply boat approaches the American warship. The two men aboard the craft smile and wave at the sailors on watch. The sailors wave back. Then, several hundred pounds of C4 explosives hidden under a tarp detonate. The blast shreds a 40 by 40 foot section of the Coles hull and almost sinks the ship. 17 crewmen are killed, 40 more injured. The suicide bombers are obliterated. Investigators recover only a few of their teeth. We will find out who was responsible and hold them accountable. But in the waning months of his second term, President Clinton takes no military action against Al-Qaeda. It is a blow to the morale of the nation's anti-terror forces. There was mounting frustration at, at the fact that no one was taking action to um, eliminate the threat to America. I think there was a tremendous sense of, you know, these guys just don't get it. These guys meaning policymakers. Protect and defend the Constitution. January 20th, 2001. George W. Bush is sworn in as President of the United States. So help me God. One of the first decisions the new president faces is whether to respond militarily to the October attack on the USS Cole. President Bush does not order retaliation. In America, after the hotly contested presidential race, life returns to normal. The Baltimore Ravens win the Super Bowl. Gladiator captures best picture at the 73rd Academy Awards. And four radical Muslims are completing their pilot's training. In the months to come, the men will turn their attention from learning how to gain control of commercial airliners to the task of breaching airport security. Spring 2001. Mohammed Atta, Marwan al Shahi, Ziad Jarrah, and Hani Hanjour, the four men who have trained to crash hijacked planes into American targets, are living in plain sight in the U.S. Most of the hijackers live apart and move around the country separately to avoid attracting attention. They rent cars, return them, and rent others. Atta and Shehi traveled to Georgia and Virginia before returning to Florida. Hanjour settles in Patterson, New Jersey with muscle hijacker Nawaf Al-Hazmi. They change apartments every month, mostly furnished rooms in seedy neighborhoods on the fringes of suburbia. One of them, Ziad Jarrah, lives not on an Al-Qaeda stipend, but on $2,000 a month, which his parents sent him from Beirut. He drives around in a used 1990 red Mitsubishi and makes at least five flights to Europe to visit his Turkish wife, Aysel. There is constant friction between Jarrah and the leader of the group, Mohammed Atta. The more easygoing Jarrah chafes under Atta's stern authority. Atta begins to suspect that Jarrah will back out of the mission. He certainly, on a relative scale of, of all of the operatives, uh, would have been the most likely one to withdraw and perhaps even spill the beans. Las Vegas, summer 2001. Atta, Shehi, and Jarrah all make trips to America's Sin City. Records show that Atta pays cash and stays at this Econa Lodge on a dreary part of the Strip. No one sees the men gamble, but Atta and Jura access the web at a local internet cafe. For months, the men move freely about the country. They use their real names on hotel ledgers, driver's licenses, and plane tickets. They were among us. You know, they lived among us for over a year. 
before they attacked us, and they did not stick out. It's not like they had two heads or horns or anything like that where you could immediately identify them as people who were coming to kill us. By this point in the summer of 2001, American intelligence agencies are detecting increased communication, what they call chatter from terrorist organizations. For example, they learn that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed is, quote, interested in sending terrorists to the United States. But they have been looking for KSM for almost five years and still don't know where to find him. They also intercept at least 33 communications indicating a possible imminent terrorist attack. One message says, unbelievable news coming in weeks. Another says, a big event. There will be a very, 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 very big uproar. The FAA briefs some of the nation's largest airports, including New Jersey's Newark, Washington Dulles, and Boston Logan. The briefings describe the increasing threats from bin Laden and the possibility of hijackings. Before the summer is over, the FAA will receive 52 specific warnings about bin Laden or Al Qaeda. Five mention hijacking. Two indicate possible suicide attacks. Even as the chatter increases, the FAA's own undercover security experts, known as the Red Team, learn that airport procedures are unlikely to stop a potential hijacker. They find that they can easily get weapons past airport checkpoints. Every area of security we tested was a gaping hole of security. None of it worked the way FAA advertised it. We literally got through security 90, roughly 90% of the time with very little problem. According to Red Team members, the FAA does not address the problem. Instead, they say, FAA officials suppress their findings and even prevent the teams from retesting airports that perform poorly. By early July, all 15 of the so-called muscle hijackers are in the U.S. Ringleader Mohammed Atta has personally greeted most of them as they arrive at the airports. The men are young, all under 30, but not physically imposing. What they lack in size, they make up for in blind loyalty to Al-Qaeda. They believe bin Laden when he assures them they will be rewarded in heaven for their sacrifice. Humble people in the Arab world, uh, receiving his message and sympathetic with him in a way or another. And that's why he managed to recruit those young chaps and send them to die as martyrs, as he called it. The four pilots scout the flight paths to their targets in rented aircraft and as passengers on commercial airliners. They fly in first class, each aboard the same type of aircraft they plan to commandeer. Jarrah and Hanjur also rent small planes and fly the Hudson Corridor, a route that takes them at low levels past the World Trade Center towers. Costa Dorada, Spain, July 2001. Mohammed Atta travels to this seaside village where he cloisters with Ramzi bin Al-Sheib. Bin Al-Sheib, who was denied a U.S. visa, is now acting as bin Laden's messenger to the hijackers. At the meeting, he tells Atta that bin Laden wants to launch the attack immediately. And Atta, at that time, according to bin Al-Sheib, expressed some doubt about whether the White House would be as easily attacked as something like the Capitol, which is a much larger structure. Atta says he needs to delay the operation for five or six weeks. He's worried that he doesn't have enough time to train the muscle hijackers. Atta also needs to organize four teams with separate itineraries into what he hopes will be a single cataclysmic event. But bin al-Sheib gives Atta a clear message. Bin Laden fears the U.S. might uncover the scheme. 
He wants the operation carried out as soon as possible. Phoenix, July 10th, 2001. At the local FBI office, field agent Ken Williams sends a memo to his superiors in Washington. He's seen a number of Middle Easterners with ties to radical Islam enroll in Arizona flight schools. Individuals of investigative interest who may be in a position to conduct terrorist activity in the future. The memo reaches FBI headquarters in Washington and the Bureau's counterterrorism unit in New York. The report doesn't reach the Bureau's upper echelons until after September 11th, and lower level FBI staff does not act on the information. Should we have stopped all counterterrorism investigations and taken and interviewed the thousands of flight students in Phoenix? I mean, I don't know. We didn't have the resources or the personnel to do that. Mohammed Atta books tickets with specific seat assignments on cross-country commercial flights out of Boston and Newark. The team leaders go from training their crews to rehearsing the precise steps necessary to take over a jetliner. Atta's plan is to smuggle simple weapons aboard the aircraft, including utility knives with small retractable blades. The hijackers sit in a carefully thought out pattern. The muscle hijackers will be here in first class near the front of the cabin. The pilot hijacker will be a few rows back and the last member of the team behind him. They refine the plan by studying routine in-flight operations, when the flight attendants begin coffee service, when the seatbelt sign is turned off, whether the cockpit doors are locked. The plan is for the men in front to storm the cockpit and kill the flight crew, allowing the pilot hijacker to take control. They will then slit the throat of at least one passenger or crew member and leave that person bleeding to death in the aisle. This, they hope, will neutralize any threat from the passengers. Crawford, Texas, August 6, 2001. President Bush is on vacation at his ranch, where he gets his daily briefing from the CIA. It's titled, Bin Laden Determined to Strike in U.S. The two-page memo states, FBI information indicates patterns of suspicious activity in this country, consistent with preparations for hijackings or other types of attacks. The White House believes there is no new threat information in the briefing to pursue. Mohammed Atta now begins to consider dates for the attack. In order to create maximum chaos in Washington, Atta wants to wait until Congress is back from its summer recess. August 29, 2001. As he will later tell a reporter, Ramzi bin al Sheib is asleep at his home in Hamburg when he receives an early morning phone call. On the other end of the line, Mohammed Atta delivers a cryptic message, quote, two sticks, a dash and a cake with a stick down. The two sticks is the number 11, the dash is the dash, and the cake with the stick down is the number nine. And that was the zero hour. 9-11, September 11th. Bin al Sheib will later claim he personally relays the message to Osama bin Laden. His teams are now in place, ready to make their attack on America. September 2001. The four teams of hijackers make final preparations. They visit area gyms and use local libraries for access to the internet. On one occasion, an ATM surveillance camera captures this photograph of pilot Hani Hanjour and muscle hijacker Majed Muked during seemingly routine daily activities. They are tying up loose ends before executing a plan they hope will kill thousands of people 
and spark a global confrontation. As has become his custom, Osama bin Laden seems to be announcing his intentions. At the London headquarters of this Arabic newspaper, Al-Quds al-Arabi, editors have received several warnings of an unprecedented strike against the U.S. The paper does not report the warnings, which arrive at the end of a summer filled with predictions of an impending attack. Intelligence officials work around the clock, trying to decipher chatter so dense it's now an avalanche of white noise. At the CIA, agents are anxious to pin down the threat. My closest lieutenants in the counterterrorism center, they were deeply disturbed. You know, there's still a big attack out there. They're coming, they want to kill Americans, and we were scrambling to try and put some meat to this. But some people in America seem to have better sources of information. Brooklyn, New York, September 6th. A freshman is studying a beginner's English text here at New Utrecht High School. But the boy, a recent Pakistani immigrant, is distracted by the Manhattan skyline visible out the classroom window. When the teacher asks what he's looking at, the boy points toward the World Trade Center. He says, do you see those two buildings? They won't be standing there next week. The teacher dismisses the comment. The FBI will later verify that this conversation took place. But agents do not determine how the boy could have known about the coming attacks. As the days until zero hour dwindle, some of the terrorists wire thousands of dollars to an account in the United Arab Emirates. Apparently, they have not spent all of the money that Al-Qaeda gave them for the plane's operation. They are returning the leftover cash. September 9th, Ziad Jarrah, who has been a constant cause of concern to Atta, may be having second thoughts. He calls his family and tells them that he'll attend a cousin's wedding in Lebanon on September 22nd. He says he has purchased a new suit for the occasion. At 12.05 a.m., Jarrah is driving 90 miles an hour when police here in Pikesville, Maryland, stop him. It's a 65 mile per hour zone. He politely answers the officer's questions. Still live in Springfield on Quicksilver Drive? Still live on Quicksilver Drive? Okay, I'll be right with you. Jara then signs the $270 ticket and drives off. Southeastern Afghanistan, September 9th. From his Tarnak Farms compound, bin Laden prepares for the battle that 9-11 will provoke. 350 miles away, General Ahmed Shah Massoud is at his headquarters in northern Afghanistan. The general is a legendary Mujahideen commander and a threat to Osama bin Laden's power. He is leader of the Northern Alliance, an Afghan coalition opposed to the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Massoud is preparing for an interview with two men who claim to be Moroccan TV reporters. The two men are, in fact, Al-Qaeda agents. Their camera is a cleverly disguised bomb. One of the agents detonates the bomb, killing Massoud and himself. The next day, with Massoud dead, Taliban forces, in conjunction with Al-Qaeda, launch an attack on the Northern Alliance. September 10th. This is 1010 Wins. You give us 22 minutes, we'll give you the world. Good morning, it's 73 degrees at 12 o'clock on this Monday, September 10th. I'm Brian Carey, and here... A bright, cloudless day on the eastern seaboard. New Yorkers ready themselves for a mayoral primary. Several candidates vie for the opportunity to replace the outgoing mayor, Rudy Giuliani. 
at the White House, President Bush and Australia's Prime Minister John Howard greet reporters outside the Oval Office. The head of the FBI's counterterrorism office receives word that the Justice Department has rejected his requests to boost his budget. Portland, Maine, 5.43 p.m. Mohammed Atta, the Egyptian graduate student in charge of the plane's operation, and muscle hijacker Abdul Aziz Alomari check in to this Comfort Inn. They get cash at this ATM and stop at this gas station. At the local Walmart, they purchase two utility knives like this. Atta's team is booked on American Flight 11 the next morning from Boston to Los Angeles. Sometime today, Ziad Jarrah writes a tender farewell letter to his wife, Iso. He told her basically that he was about to in our paradise, and that he hoped that she would be proud of him. Boston. Pilot Marwan El Shehi and two members of his team stay at this hotel. One of them calls an escort service and asks what it would cost to have a prostitute sent to one of their rooms. The $400 price tag is apparently too high for them. Muscle hijackers and brothers, Hamza and Ahmed Alhamdi check into this day's hotel in the city's Brighton neighborhood. Hamza orders a pornographic movie on the in-house video system. Shehi's team holds five tickets on United's morning flight 175 from Boston to Los Angeles. Newark, New Jersey, September 11th, 12.05 a.m. Pilot Ziad Jarrah enters this airport Marriott. He pays $450 in cash for two non-smoking rooms. Jarrah and his team have four tickets for later this morning on United Flight 93 from Newark to San Francisco. Herndon, Virginia. Pilot Hani Hanjur is with his team in a hotel close to Washington Dulles Airport. They are booked on American Flight 77, a morning flight bound for Los Angeles. All 19 of the hijackers are now in their hotel rooms. Some have trained to fly huge jets. Others only to kill with a small blade. Some of the men read a set of instructions entitled, Last Night. The handwritten document directs them to stand firm and inspect their weapons. In part, the letter says, know the plan well, vow to accept death, Purify your heart and cleanse it of stains. Let your breast be filled with gladness. To God we shall return. Nineteen men go to bed, knowing that the next morning they will attempt to execute an attack based on their deeply held beliefs in radical Islam. <laughs> It's a plan that grew from a casual conversation between childhood friends and was nurtured by Osama bin Laden. They will bring the Jihad to America.
National Geographic Channel. Dare to explore.